next speaker, Padmashri Swaminathan Shivram. A little bit about his introduction. He is a polymer chemist, inventor, institution builder, and a former director of CSIR NCL at Pune. Dr. Shivram, a simple person, is greatly known for the highest number of US patents by an Indian working outside the United States. Okay, thank you so much. Please, somebody can move it. Uh, I have had the privilege of today hearing some fascinating talks in this session, and also I was there in the earlier session. And I think uh, I thank the organizers for my uh, for giving me an opportunity to share my perspective. Uh, I was thinking about a few things to talk about, but having heard uh, Professor Yadav and later Professor Vasudevan, I'm glad I did not talk about plastics because I think <laughs> they have a bit between them uh, talk enough about plastics. So I, I thought that I will restrict my observations to something more uh, uh, bordering on philosophy rather than uh, anything else because I, I feel that this word sustainability is being used today rather indiscriminately. And, the, and I believe that if you use a word without thinking about the meaning of that word, uh, you start doing disservice to that, you know, to the message behind that word. And uh, although I think sustainability has been well defined and people understand it, but uh, I see in scientific papers, in discourses, anything and everything is called sustainable, you know. And without putting things through the what I call the lens of uh, evidence to show that something is sustainable. And I believe that this lack of scientific and uh, other evidence uh, makes this process a rather difficult process for a common man to understand. So I'm just going to share my perspective. Uh, I Nothing I'm saying is new. I'm sure many of you know about this, uh, but I'm just trying to put it in my own words. So I call this the 10 truths of sustainability. What I believe are 10 things that define in my mind uh, what this sustainability issue is all about. I'm not going to be talking about materials, plastics, or any other uh, carbon dioxide or hydrogen. I think uh, uh, my good friend uh, Ganpati Yadav has already I think, spent uh, quite a bit of uh, time elaborating those aspects, uh, but this is something a bit more general. Okay, can I have the first slide? Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Okay, the first thing that we must understand that sustainability is a complex and wicked problem. And uh, it's a difficult choice uh, because what we are trying to do when we do, when we're talking about sustainability is we are using the principle of lesser of the two evils. Now, this define, this, in, this is kind of, you know, ensure that you understand that there are two things that you have to choose from. What are those two things? And that's where we sometimes miss the uh, issue. So we are always trying to make a choice when it comes to sustainability. But then when we make a choice, we sometimes get carried away by our own personal bias. And therefore, we don't, we don't realize that every decision we make has a consequence. And the question is, do we think about the unintended consequences of our decision? Now, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, our forefathers made decisions in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where the science was not so well developed. And therefore, I think in retrospect, they probably made some errors of judgment for which we are paying today. The question basically is, 100 years from today, 200 years from today, will the generation that exists at that point of time, will they say something different about us? Or will they say the same thing about us that we are today talking about the people who lived 200 years ago who made certain decisions for us? So I think the real danger in sustainability, I believe, is trying to simplify a very complex problem. Sometimes we say, oh, this is a solution, that is a solution. And I think sometimes I wonder whether we have really got, you know, put it through the lens of what I call evidence-based decision-making before we say this is a solution. In fact, the best uh, uh, statement that I can reproduce or re quote here is 
uh, Harold Benkin, who was a humorist and a journalist in America, who said, for every complex question, there is a simple answer, and it is invariably wrong. I'm not saying that we are wrong about looking at sustainability today, but I think we have to be cautious that we could, we could prove to be wrong. The second slide, please. Well, the other one is the sustainability is a multivariate problem with deep interdependence across variables. Now, this is something that uh, a good scientists and engineers appreciate because we, we have to look at sustainability on what is called two, two dimensions of scales the spatial scale and the temporal scale. And our human mind is incapable of analyzing a problem, not only with respect, in, in, especially with respect to four dimensions. You know, we, are, we have to analyze sustainability in four dimensions, the, the, the length, the breadth, the, the depth, and the time dimension. And I think that's where most people fail because they look at sustainability in some kind of a one or two dimensions. And then they leave the rest of the dimensions out because it's too complex for them to look at it. And that's where the problem comes. And therefore, I think we all understand today in the earth system sciences, if we look at it, that this ability to understand, model, simulate, compute, uh, and, and then you know, visualize the effect of any human, in, human action you know, in this multidimensional aspect of sustainability is something that not many people are able to do, and including scientists. I'm not talking about the common man on the street. Even scientists are sometimes not willing to look at it. Therefore, if you look at the next slide, I think this has been now brought out very clearly in the global uh, literature. And that is, if you look at the science of sustainability, you know what we have to worry about is this impact of our decision making on what is called planetary boundaries. And the planetary boundaries are defined here for you. And I think this is something that we cannot fail to you know, factor into every decision making that we do in sustainable, uh, you know, whether it's technology, whether it's science or whether it's solution. And, and we belong to a very complex adaptive system whose stability depends on a very delicate equilibrium. And I think uh, some of the previous speakers did point this out. And when they're overstressed, they become unstable and can collapse abruptly. In fact, this is a real danger. And we are already trying to overstress this delicate system today. And the question is, how long before it breaks down? Uh, humans in this complex adaptive ecosystem, we are all, we consider ourselves very intelligent. We, are very, we consider ourselves very smart. But you know what? We have the power of technology to influence everything, but we don't control anything at all in this system, which I call the planetary boundary system. And this is the problem because we can change things. We can create new technologies, but unfortunately we can't control the impact of any of these on the planetary boundaries. And that's where I think the great responsibility rests on all of us uh, to be extremely careful when we talk about this term sustainability. If I have the next slide, I call it, now it comes to, now you can go ahead. The sustainability is a classic problem of the tragedy of the commons. I think uh, this is something that many people have said, you know, today a resource belongs to everybody. That's a problem, okay? And therefore it is not cared for anybody. We all know that if a resource is scarce, we pay more attention to it. But the resource is cheap, we do not pay attention to it. And that's the reasons why we have gotten into this problem. And another fallacy is that everyone is trying to maximize everything for oneself. And therefore, you maximize every benefit to yourself, you know, being a very selfish human being, uh, you cannot, it's not the best decision for the society collectively. As rational human beings, each one of us are trying to maximize our personal gain without limits in a world that is limited. And I always say that humanity is driven by selfish interest and the desire to get this personal gain is what is driving this, this tragedy of the commons. And therefore, uh, we have this problem today. If I have the next slide, which is, I call it the truth number four, 
sustainability is a problem related to how we handle our increasing desire for consumption in a world of diminishing natural resources. I think this is, uh, we all know that this world is actually pivoted uh, on three types of capital, the ecosystem goods and services, the man-made capital goods and services, and the social capital goods and services. And the question basically is, if you look at this in totality, which is what you need to do when you look at sustainability, can technology alone be sufficient to address the problem of converting limited natural resource of nature to meet the unlimited demands of humanity? Now, this is a fundamental question that I think we should ask ourselves. If I have the next slide. There's been a lot of discussion today about recycling and circular economy principles. Uh, I believe, yes, recycling and circular economy principles are needed, they are necessary, but it's not sufficient uh, to win this battle of sustainability. And uh, this is where, you know, we have so many potential solutions. The question basically is, are they viable? And anything and everything can be recycled, but how much, which of these is viable is what we have to ask. And also, whenever we talk about circular economy, we have to also look at viability from the point of view of thermodynamics. Uh, I can talk separately on the subject because without you know, bringing in thermodynamics, without looking at enthalpy and entropy, you cannot talk about viability of any kind of a process that we use in circular economy. Chemistry can transform anything into anything, but there's a cost for every transformation. And the question basically is, are those costs viable? Are those costs sustainable? Economic costs of recycling or converting waste to reusable resources and the consequent costs to the consumers are not trivial. And I think we have to, therefore, when we, when we talk about circular economy as a solution to the problem of sustainability, I think we have to be cautious and say where it makes sense and where it does not make sense. I think we have to say both. Uh, otherwise, we are trying to brush things under a carpet, which is not correct. And poorly designed circular economy concept would be yet another example of good intentions leading to regrettable consequences. And I think this is something that we need to worry about. The next slide, I talk about the sixth one. And this is something that I, I tend to differ from some of the speakers who came earlier. Sustainability cannot merely be reduced to a problem in science and technology. And I think we should not convey to the society that science and technology has the solution to every problem that we face today in this world. And I think the more we say that, the more we lose the credibility of the science. And I think we have to be cautious when we promise something that science can deliver. And I think we must promise, we must, when we, when we, when we promise that we can deliver, we must actually deliver. And therefore, I believe strongly that it is good to say it's good to under promise and over deliver. I think science sometimes and scientists over promise and under deliver, which I think is damaging to both science and technology. Sustainability is actually a systems challenge. It requires a combination of reductionist approaches and integrative thinking, integrative systems and design thinking. We still do not have many tools to define unintended consequences. If we have a solution today, what is the consequence of the solution, let's say, 50 years from today? Do we have the right tool to analyze and predict? We don't have it. Now, this is something that uh, Professor Yadav pointed out. Nature has designed this universe in the form of cycles, where everything is returned back to nature after the reuse. Whereas humans, in the last 200 years of industrial revolution, have designed processes and technology in a linear fashion. We still do not know how to convert this linear process into a sustainable cyclic process. I think we have too early to talk about these things and say these could be solutions. And I think, therefore, sometimes when we are talking about sustainability, we are at the, at the fringe of science, technology, and society. And therefore, the society cannot be, you know, uh, the society, if it is told, no, no, there's no problem, science will solve your problem. And we don't solve this problem for the next 50, 100 years. I think the society will lose credibility of the science. And that's the risk we run if we are not very careful about offering solutions. 
And therefore, this last one is extremely important. And this is called the very well-known you know, principle in philosophy and law, which is called the precautionary principle. I think this is something that science should apply to itself. And that is that we must, we must understand that innovations with potential for causing harm when extensive scientific knowledge in the matter is lacking. If we do not have enough understanding of the science that we are trying to propagate, we are trying to provide as a solution, then I think there's a potential damage, there's a potential harm that we could cause when we use this scientific knowledge in practice. I think what we are asked, what the precautionary principle is teaching us is, you, you know, it's kind of, you have to be cautious, you pause, review before leaping into new innovations that may prove disastrous. Because please understand that every innovation that came to this planet Earth for the last 200 years, they came because they offered some revolutionary benefit to the humanity. But why are we today complaining about some of them? That's because the precautionary principles were not applied at that point of time. The question is, are we applying precautionary principles, the new innovations that we are now talking about, in order that we don't commit the same error that our forefathers committed? Otherwise, we are not doing any service to society. If I have the next slide, which is, I call it the seventh slide, which is the seventh truth, economic growth and sustainability do go hand in hand. And this is something that we can debate endlessly. Uh, I think uh, we don't have to worry about this. All that will require is, and that is something that we do not know how to do because it flies in the face of economics today. And that is we have to decouple economic growth with resource consumption. If we do not learn to decouple economic growth with resource consumption, with a 10 billion population cannot live the lifestyle of a Swiss resident or an Austrian resident. You know, 10 billion people cannot aspire for that kind of a lifestyle. And that's where the problem comes. But at the same time, the society has to live well, healthy, eat well, have, have occupation, have, have a livelihood. Therefore, you have to learn to decouple economic growth from resource consumption. And this is very important, very beautifully talked about in this cartoon, uh, which is uh, sometime in the future, a bunch of groups of people from industry are sitting together. There is no electricity. They have burning wood to create fire. And they say, yes, this planet got destroyed. But for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for our shareholders. Uh, that should not be our story in the future. If I have the next slide. There are no two standards of sustainability, one for the developed world and the other for the developing world. And this is sometimes missed in our discussions. And I think there is only one standard of sustainability for everyone. And I think everyone has to fall in place. Now that's where a lot of effort is required. And uh, I think the poor of this world have greater stake in sustainability than the rich in my opinion. And uh, therefore I believe that the growing income inequality is actually one of the major threats to sustainability. If I have the next slide, which is number nine, which I say journey towards sustainability requires enhanced efficiency and resilience. Uh, in fact, this has proven very, very, very well during the last one year of the pandemic. You know, how, how business has learned to become more efficient and resilient. And I think that is a lesson. I think I think this COVID. I agree to some extent with what uh, Professor Vasudevan said. This COVID came at the beginning of the 21st century again as a precautionary principle to say, please pause, think, and then move ahead. And I think this is what is teaching us that efficiency and resilience is is the foundation of of uh, uh, sustainability. We have to learn to be as efficient as nature is. And we must learn not to pursue supporting systems beyond their ability to recover from disturbances. Because as I told you, we live in a very delicate equilibrium. You can't distort or disturb this equilibrium. And if you distort or disturb this equilibrium, I think that's where the tragedy of the commons will occur. If I have the last slide, which is my 10th slide, uh, which shocks about sustainability, is ultimately a new way of thinking and doing. This requires a change in mindsets and significant social engineering 
which I think some other people, including Kartikeya, pointed out at the beginning of this talk. And I think sustainability thinking and action begins with myself and yourself. And I think education is going to be extremely important. How we educate our new generation of young people, right from schools to colleges to universities, is going to be a key problem. We can't change our generation. We can't change maybe even our next generation. But I think if we, if we, if we kind of educate our younger people, I think the next generation will be saved. That, in my opinion, is our only hope uh, for sustainability. If I have the last slide, and if I have the last slide, it's a beautiful slide. I just got it in my WhatsApp. I hope it's a true slide. It's not a doctored slide. I think many of you may have seen it in your WhatsApp. You know, uh, I wish it is true, but I have to fact check this, okay, at this moment. It could have been a doctor's slide. Uh, there is a drop of water on a leaf, and there are 12 ants drinking from it. They have divided themselves into four groups of three ants each to balance on the leaf so that the water doesn't run off. Because if they do it any other way, the water will drop off due to gravity. Okay? Wonders of nature. What, are, what is this wonder, wondrous nature? Cooperative behavior, resource sharing, self-enforced order, frugality. To me, these are the fundamental precepts. These are the fundamental precepts on which the future of sustainability rests. So the rest of it, we can keep talking about it. But if we are not cooperative, if we don't share our resources, if we don't have what is called a self-enforced order, and if we are not frugal with our consumption, sustainability is a lost goal. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And maybe the last slide is, a, is a my concluding slide.